Cool. So yeah, um, here we are in week two. Thanks for everybody who was able to log on to Teachable and introduce yourselves. Um, feel free to shoot me an email, get in touch if there's any confusion about logging on or finding the week's content or navigating through it. Um, first week was pretty light, just getting you familiar with some of the resources, downloading some things. Um, and introducing yourself. But starting this week, we'll have a little more and we'll kind of keep ratcheting things up a bit as we go. Uh, quick note on the kits or mushroom projects. You still have time if you want to order. Um, and there is information in Teachable about how to find that kit. Um, and you could also source that spawn from another supplier as well. Um, and so I'm going to make sure. Uh, that the list of what's in the kit is very clear on the Teachable website because um, you could get it from somewhere else. And next week we'll talk about inoculations and that'll be a chance for you to, uh, after that class, um, try it out yourself. And the, you know, the real advantage of this is you get a hands-on experience and you can ask questions because you've experienced it. Um, and so that's a really nice thing to do. They're all really easy. Um, you don't have to do them next week. You could do them later in the course doesn't matter, but that's just an option that's there. So week three is really when we'll go over inoculations and talk about that part of the process. You can ask questions at any time in the Teachable forum for the week um, about the topic that we present or the questions we ask or the prompts that we give, but you can also just ask any old question. And I see all those comments. I didn't respond individually to everybody's intros, but um, I appreciate reading about your stories and where you're coming from and what your interests are, but feel free to keep peppering comments in there and we'll, we'll have some dialogue in between classes. So I think that's it for now. Um, really happy this week and week two, we like to um, think about and talk about mushroom cultivation, especially outdoor cultivation in the context of forest ecology and forest management. Um, so we're gonna spend the first hour with Peter Smallage, who is our state extension forester who's tailored some of his um, talk to some of the considerations specifically if you're, if you're getting into mushroom production. And then we'll take a real short break, just a few minutes between presentations, and then I'll give just a short intro to uh, the sort of the, the options for buying or selling bolts and kind of um, what we've found in our experience with that and some resources to help you source that material because you might be a person who wants to cut those trees and acquire that wood, or you might be a person who doesn't want to do those things or doesn't have access to the woods or the time or any of those things. And so, um, so there's options out there. There's, there's plenty of wood out in the world. We just have to get it to the right, <laughs> into the right hands. And um, so we'll end the night talking about that. During the webinar, feel free to put questions in the group chat at any time. And um, uh, Peter's really familiar with this format, so he may, answer questions as we go, or we might stop periodically. But anytime that something comes up, feel free to use the chat feature. And then finally, just as a reminder, uh, please do keep your, your mic muted and your video off just so that everyone's internet connection is solid for, um, for our presentation. So yeah, with that, I'm gonna welcome Peter Smallage and I will mute myself and let you take it away, Peter. Thanks for being here tonight. All right, thank you very much, Steve. So let me see if I can figure out how to f show the chat. This isn't working. Steve said I was familiar with this and it's not working very well for me. <laughs> so I can't see the chat. Um, I can also read questions if okay. you wanna ask me at any so point. I, so certainly if, if there's one that's, you know, that jumps out that is timely and should be responded to, um, please go ahead and do that. And um, just feel free to jump in and interrupt. Um, so um, thank you, Steve, for this opportunity to talk about mushroom bolt production. This is uh, um, Steve and the folks at Small Farms have done a fabulous job of, I think, being out in front of the curve of using this kind of technology for teaching and being able to connect with people that live hither and yon and far away and or close by, but being able to do uh, educational programming in a way that's, that's um, sensitive to the time 
that people have. Everybody, you know, we're all uh, have busy lives. You all have busy lives, and it's uh, it's it's a nice way to be able to connect with you. So I'm going to be talking about uh, woodland management and ecology in support of mushroom bolt production. Uh, as Steve said, I'm uh, the New York State Extension Forester and Director of Arnott's Teaching and Research Forest. Um, one of my first slides is gonna be something like, we can't cover everything in an hour. And so I'll call your attention to the two websites that you see on the screen, forestconnect.info, <clears throat> and then the Forest Connect channel on YouTube. So I run a webinar series and archive all of them on YouTube. And I have lots of written materials about woodlot management on uh, forestconnect.info. So here's the outline. I'll let you read it. It's just kind of a uh, maybe a logical flow, um, working down through kind of defining some terms. Item number three is the, the bulk of it, uh, thinking about how do we manage our woods for bolts. Uh, then we think about, we talk a little bit specifically about sapwood. And then for me, a primary interest is safety. So anybody that's working in the woods should be very safe. Uh, none of us make enough money to make to risk dying over it. So uh, be safe and we'll talk in greater details. So some assumption and caveats is I'm assuming that you spend time in the woods and so that you've you spent time looking at trees and thinking about the woods and thinking about how things are going and you may not be able to explain what's happening but you understand patterns and you've seen processes and you see the way things work in the forest. Um, and you're willing to think about the woods differently. So I'll, I'm gonna be giving some kind of basic introductory woodlot management principles here today. If they, if they diverge from what you're used to, then feel free to ask questions and we'll talk about those, um, but at least give them some consideration. Um, when you're working in the woods, be deliberate. I recommend I keep a little uh, right in the rain pocket notebook and I make notes and you know, I've got notebooks that go back for years and years, uh, just things that you see and, and it's amazing what you can, you can glean from that as you uh, go through time. Um, and then the best bolts are um, of specific species, primarily species like red maple, I'm sorry, hard maple or sugar maple, red oak, beech, hop horn meme and have as much sapwood as possible. So I've got those species spelled out there, sugar maple, red oak, beech, and hop horn beam. Um, and some of this may have changed a little bit. I'm not, um, I didn't, I was gonna send Steve an email and say, hey, are these still the best species? So um, if I've, if I picked the wrong species, just ignore that. The, the principles that we're talking about are gonna be the same. Um, the science of forestry is more than 100, well, we're pushing 120 years old. The science of growing uh, mushroom on mushrooms on bolts is younger. I don't, I don't have a timeline for that. The point here is that we can talk really well about and we know what, what we need to do to manage forests, um, but we're less sure about, or at least I'm less sure about how to specifically go about um, it, in circumstances, well, let's say where you're deliberately trying to farm bolts for the production of mushrooms. Now I'll use, I've already, I've used uh, the words forest and woodlot interchangeably and that's by design. Um, some people think of it as a forest, some think of it as a woodlot. So um, I'm not a mushroom producer. I think it's very cool. I've been around mushroom producers. I've um, supported some things that Steve has done you know, from a forest management or woodlot management um, perspective, but you probably know, some of you are gonna know a lot more than I know about the production of the mushrooms. Um, so don't, if I get off and I say something I'm not supposed to, and I usually am pretty careful about that, but if I go off on a tangent, go ahead and stop me and correct me, that's quite all right. And then I'll do this in an hour or less, and it'd be fun to talk for a lot longer, but obviously that's not possible. So let's look at kind of two different ways of doing this. We're gonna focus on the consequential side of bolts, um, but there is a deliberate side of bolts. And that's where you go into a woods like you might see on the right. And it's a young, relatively young woodland or it could be a little bit older than that. The average size stems in there are somewhere around uh, probably three or four inches. That happens to be red maple, which isn't a great species for bolts, I guess. 
um, but you could find similar woodlands of sugar maple or American beech or hop horn beam. And then you go through a process that's called coppicing. And so coppicing is where you cut the stems low in the ground, they sprout from the stump and make what's called a stool. And then you essentially manage those stools for the production of boltwood. This is something that is, I'm, and I'm not familiar with this as a deliberate practice. I understand the physiology behind it, but in terms of managing woodlands via a coppice for um, stools, it's not something I've, I've uh, done any study of. It's, it's my sense that it's more common in the United Kingdom, Britain than it is here, but I'm not certain of that. So, um, but I'd be happy to, I mean, if somebody was really interested in doing this, I got, I have some ideas, I'd be happy to share those. And I think there's books around that you could look at. Probably what's more common for everybody excuse me, is that you're gonna have bolts that are produced as a consequence of doing other things in your woods. Most woodlands in New York and in the Eastern US and all that I have seen typically have mixtures of species and diameters of trees and qualities of stems. There are some stems that have a quality that's really suitable for a high, high value product like saw timber. Um, and that doesn't mean you can't get boltwood from it, but they're gonna be, you're gonna merchandise, you're gonna, you're gonna focus on the highest value uh, products for uh, their highest and best use. <clears throat> Almost all of the woodlands in the Eastern United States have had some kind of previous management. Uh, most of it has been happenstance at best. Some of it has been exploitive um, and probably almost none of it in terms of the percentage of acres has focused on boltwood production. So there's a lot of boltwood out there, but you're not gonna inherit a woods or buy a woods where the previous owner said, I'm gonna make sure this is really good production for boltwood. So I mentioned some of the trees are gonna have very high value for things like timber or veneer uh, or maple syrup production. Um, and I don't know how the economics of maple versus mushrooms plays out, but it's, it's up to you as the owner to decide how you're gonna allocate particular stems into particular value categories. Um, maybe the good news is that uh, for those woodlands that have been exploitively logged or, or even abused, uh, in some cases they may have really good production of bolts because that releases, that tends to open up and allow to grow some of those poorer form stems which are great for bolts and that faster growth will make better sapwood and so those, that's kind of the silver lining on an otherwise dark cloud. But ultimately, you're going to have to do some planning if you want to optimize both bolts and other products. So, and, and I'm assuming that in, in, in most cases, there are things that you're going to be interested in beyond just bolts. So that, that planning is going to be that much more important. The parts of the plan are relatively simple and everybody plans as a regular part of life. So this is not anything new and it's, and it's what I'm doing here is just framing it in a way that it's relative to what we do with our woodlands. So the, the plan is going to have a statement of who's on the team. Uh, and that's you probably, a spouse or partner or aunts or uncles or siblings or children or parents. Um, it may be just you, but it may also be other people and then they don't have to be necessarily related. They don't have to be owners of the property, but they have a, a strong interest or a passion in what's happening. So they should be included as part of that team. You're no doubt going to want to include mushroom production as one of your objectives, but there's probably other things you want to do. Maybe you want firewood, maybe you want hiking trails, maybe you want bird watching, maybe you want maple syrup production, maybe you want timber and maple and firewood and mushrooms. I don't know what, but make a list and, and identify those things. And to the extent that you I would, you don't need to do it from the beginning, but you may come to a point where you have to make some decisions about what you're gonna do in one place. And that might be uh, exclusive of other things that you're gonna do on a particular acre. Um, think about what you want to accomplish. That's the desired point. So what you want is to have um, a thousand bolts in production or a hundred bolts in production 
or you want to have 250 bolts and you want to have a thousand maple taps or whatever. So it's not what you have now, it's where you want to be. So it's the desired outcome. And then you say, what do I have now? So the current resources are what's your woods? How many acres do you have? What do the woods look like? How do you describe them? And we'll talk a little bit about that in just a minute. Um, what other tools do you have? <coughs> Excuse me. And who are the people that you have as resources and assets? So that may be part of the team. It may be that there's a forester that you like to work with. It may be that there's a logger that you have. Um, it may be that you have a good market. It may be that your neighbor sells uh, pastured beef and you can sell mushrooms and maple as part of that. So this, just think about everything that's gonna come into play that's to your advantage. And then the hard part or the fun part and the creative part is what do you need to do to get from where you are to where you want to be? So uh, this in a, in a forest and not understanding maybe the way forests work very well and we'll go into a little bit of that. Um, the good news is that every state has a state forestry agency that will come out and visit with you and help you develop a what's called a forest stewardship plan. So a forest stewardship plan, it's free. Well, it's your tax dollars at work. The forester that comes out may not know anything about mushroom production. They've probably heard about it at least. And you'll have to do some education for them to, to give them targets about what you're looking for. But then from there, once they have the targets, they as a forester can help make decisions about what you need to do on the ground. There are lots of benefits to having a plan. The biggest one is the first bullet, I think is it allows you to have conversations with people that are on your team and you know exactly what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, you can do other things like document the health of your woodlands and the resources, the equipment that you have. It allows you to then from that, from documenting those assets, plan for the replacement or plan for improving those assets as you need to. Um, I don't know how it fits into mushroom production, which is probably considered a farming activity from a woodlot management perspective. Having a management plan is important for documenting your role if you want to take advantage of certain uh, federal tax revenue provisions. Um, it allows you through scheduling to strategize for the future. And then again, in New York State, there's a forest tax law that, um, that may help uh, may be benefited by having um, a written management plan. So I'm not real sure how mushroom production fits into uh, 488, but there's probably a way. The next thing is to look at the, so, so part of the plan is having your resources, which includes a list of tree species. And you can be thinking about what are the tree species that you have present in your woods and what are they good for? And there are some species like um, aspen that are maybe really good for mushroom production. There, I don't have wildlife up here that's good for as a wildlife cover. You know, it's fair for silvopasture, let's say, and it's poor for firewood. There are other species like sugar maple and red oak and American beech that tend to be pretty good across the board. And so you have to play to your strengths and you can't, you're not going to go out and do a conversion of a section of your woods, but look and see what you have growing and then think about how those are going to fit which, uh, which of your objectives. Um, as you uh, think about your current condition and what you want to accomplish with, uh, in a, with a future outcome, you're going to need a toolbox of principles, of skills, of decision-making tools, decision support systems that will guide your decision-making and how you work through the woods. And the way that toolbox is what foresters call silviculture. So silva, and I've just broken the word down here in its Latin form, I just, this is kind of a fun thing to do. Silva deals with trees, culture deals with manipulating for the purposes of growth. And when you put that together, we have an art and a science that controls four characteristics of, uh, of a woodlot. And here it says a forest stand to stand, and a forest is like a particular field in a farmer's property. So a hay field or a corn field or a uh, pasture. So think of it as a management unit where there's similarity. 
And what silviculture does is it controls the establishment. And after the woodlands and the trees have been established or, you, or the land already has forest established, then silviculture addresses what's the composition or the makeup of the species, what's the growth rate, how fast are they growing, and what's the quality of the trees. And all of this has to be, of course, within a context of sustainability. <laughs> so the steps to implementing a silvicultural system starts with, it has to start with an inventory. Things have to be quantified. It's, it's imperative that you know what you're working with. Um, from that, you can characterize the mixture of species or the lack of mixture of species, whatever, whatever species are there, we describe that as the composition. And then the number and size of the stems is called the structure. So foresters will say, we're gonna, you know, we're worried about composition and structure, just what species are there and how big are the trees and how many are there. And then you look and say, well, what's, what's keeping this particular stand or this particular management unit from, um, from reaching its, um, reaching its desired outcomes. What are those barriers? You write a prescription that says we need to do activities A, B, and C, and that's going to take us down this pathway. And then there are tools or methods, whether it's harvesting or, uh, or focused grazing, deliberate grazing, or um, you know, small-scale harvesting, large-scale harvesting that we call treatments that manipulate the forest and it, and it moves you towards that desired outcome. And then you check and see, did it work? So you monitor the response, you document what you did, and then it's just, it's an ongoing iterative process. So those are, that's kind of the consequential process. You're, you're gonna be manipulating the woodlands to achieve some end, and as a result of that manipulation, you'll be producing bolts because it's part of one of your objectives and um, it may not be that when you're working in the woods that you're working you know the bolts may be kind of what is left over when you take out higher value products you may be most excited about the bolts because you're most passionate about the mushrooms but there may be other things involved like saw timber or firewood or maple syrup production so that's that's kind of a, a a foundation. Now let's jump into thinking about ecology and management for bolts and for more than just bolts. Uh, one thing to keep in mind as we're talking about this is that you're probably going to want to go with uh, what I'll call a highest and best use when you look at the trees. This is just a, a run-of-the-mill picture of a woodland and the blue arrows identify trees that probably have uh, some value for saw timber. And so a saw timber tree standing on the ground like that big one in the front, um, if it was 16 or 18 inches in diameter, that might be worth, um, for saw timber, that might be worth, you know, let's say $100 or $200 on the stump. It might be worth $75. But if you took that down and you made it into firewood, that tree worth, tree value for firewood <coughs> at 18 inches, uh, quick math here is going to be worth about eight dollars on the stump. You can split it and add value to it and deliver it and add value to it, but on the stump you've got that range. If you if it was um, for bolt wood, it's going to be something uh, intermediate for that. Now the beauty is the tree is too big. If it's eighteen inches, it's too big to use for bolt wood, but it has limbs and branches that you can use for bolt wood. So all I want you to do is just when you're looking at these at your woods. Think about how you want to do this highest and best use and how many different, you could have three different colors or four different colors of arrows up here. Think about how you want to, how, uh, how much you want to focus on different things. Um, uh, so it's just, this is just saying it's, there's more to the woodlands than just mushroom bolts. At least I'll encourage you to think about that. Some of the species, some identification. This is northern red oak. Uh, northern red oak is the species is Quercus rubra. The, there's a subgenus of red oak that includes all of the red oaks that are characterized by having bristle tips or little hairs, pointed hairs on the ends of the lobes. As you can see in that upper picture, if you can see my cursor, that's a bristle tip. Um, they tend to have dark colored bark. 
The acorn meat is bitter um, as compared to white oak, but I'd encourage you to go ahead and eat a white oak acorn and tell me that that isn't also bitter. The, uh, the buds on the ends of the branches tend to be sharp pointed. And then if you cut the twig in cross section, and that's the circle that you see down here, the pith or the spongy part tends to have a star. Um, you have to use a little bit of an imagination. So that's Northern Red Oak and the, and the Red Oaks in general. Sugar Maple is differentiated from Red Maple in a couple of different ways. One, the sinuses on Sugar Maple are rounded. <coughs> Excuse me, versus the sinuses on Red Maple are acute. The margin or the edge of the leaf on Sugar Maple is smooth. The margin on red maple is toothed or serrate. Um, another easy way to tell in the spring, red maple produces seed that drops. Uh, sugar maple, the seed matures over the summer. It's produced in the spring. It matures over the summer and the, and the, the seeds are dropped in the fall. So those are characterizing those two. The American beech is a very common species. It's the most common um, pole size tree that we have in New York. There's about a billion beech trees that are between one and five inches in diameter, and that number has been increasing about 10% um, every five years. So 10% increase on a billion, and those five inch, four and five inch beech saplings pretty quickly get into decent sized uh, boltwood um, categories. The leaves are simple, they're glossy, the twigs are relatively slender and brown and have elongated buds. <coughs> Excuse me. So the way your woods look um, depends upon <clears throat> things like the tolerance of those trees for shade, their genetics, the local environment, so soils and aspect, and then just chance. And uh, from that, there are winners and losers. Some trees do well, so they grow tall, and other trees don't grow so well. Uh, shade tolerance is uh, broken up into things like intolerant. So these are species that have to have full sunlight. And as you look down that list, there's not a lot that jump out at me as necessarily being good for boltwood. Aspen is used for maybe for growing um, oysters, but it's not until you get into maybe some of the mid tolerant or the tolerant species that you're gonna find some better boltwood. And, and the tolerant species, it doesn't mean that they don't like sunlight. It just means that they can endure shade. Um, another aspect of shade is that we have uh, the development of horizontal layers in the forest canopy. And the upper canopy trees, <laughs> I apologize. The upper canopy trees have full access to sunlight. The lower canopy trees do not. So those, because the upper canopy trees have more sunlight, they have bigger crowns, they have more foliage. So if you give them more sunlight, and sunlight is the most important variable in the growth of forest trees, those upper canopy trees are going to grow three to eight times faster than the lower canopy trees. So by focusing the growth on those, you're going to grow them bigger, faster, and uh, they'll have more sapwood, more branch wood, things like that. But let's look at how forests develop, and you can think about over time what you might expect will follow this kind of pattern of disturbance through time.
So the first stage is called the seedling uh, size class, and this is uh, seedling sapling size class. This is one to five inches diameter breast height or DBH. In a case like this, there are going to be thousands of stems per acre. The largest diameter stems are the fastest growing species. So there are species like aspen, whether it's big tooth aspen or quaking aspen, pin cherry. Beech can do well. Um, and there's typically few, if any, products that are going to come out of this um, immediately just because they're so small. It doesn't mean you couldn't, um, but just relatively few. The second stage is called the pole sized. Uh, pole size class. Uh, this is like a perfect size class, uh, I'm thinking, for kind of the inner, inner the transition from seedling sapling into pole is going to be a great size class for production of bolts. Hundreds of stems per acre. And at this point, the crown classes have started to form layers. You have the upper canopy trees and the lower canopy trees. And this is a nice time to be thinking about harvesting bolts because they're perfectly sized and you can remove them if you have. So typically we tell woodlot owners it's not worth going in and doing work in these younger size classes because it, it doesn't pay economically. But if you can go into a woods as a maple producer or a mushroom producer and harvest bolts, you can justify the work and essentially write it off as a, you know, in an accounting sense, you know, that's, that's labor that goes into the production of the bolts and you're not carrying that labor cost, if you will, in quotes, for the, for the long-term uh, development and growth of those trees. The third size class is small saw timber. So this is 12 inches to 16 inches. Here the trees have economic value, not very much from a timber perspective, but it's important that, that you see this as a place again, that you can be thinning in the woods and working in the woods and collecting bolts that are of immediate value and benefit to you. And there's a longer term benefit because you're giving more sunlight to the trees that you leave behind. You, as you can, and you can cut trees that are of poor form that are not going to be good timber trees. And you can see in that bottom bullet there the bolts from those smaller diameter trees or the top wood of larger diameter trees are going to be available in an option for you. And then uh, finally, you'll get into medium or large saw timber, which are bigger than 16 inches in diameter. Here you're going to have mixtures of very low value and also very high value stems. So the decisions that you're making have economic consequences. You're going to find small stems, um, such as you see maybe in kind of the, in the middle here where you see my cursor. These are trees that you might want to call younger trees because they're smaller, but in all likelihood, they're the same age. Um, they just haven't grown as well. And there are things that you can be thinking about in terms of perpetuating the forest, keeping those biggest trees as a seed source. Um, it, eventually you can harvest them for timber, but in the, in the shorter run, uh, you can be thinking about how to clear the understory in areas, protect that understory from deer, get seedlings established, and then you can go into harvesting those larger trees. So as trees, um, as a forest, as a woodlot matures, trees compete for sunlight, sunlight and some of those trees are going to lose. Uh, this is a picture from a, a sugar bush up in the eastern Adirondacks, and it's one of the most heavily stocked stands I'd ever been in. It was just, you couldn't squeeze another tree in there if you tried. And it's just, there were, there were trees that were very clearly winners, uh, and trees, trees that were very clearly losers, and other trees that were, because they were so heavily competed for sunlight, they were winners, but they were winners in a weak sort of way. So when you go into thin, you're going to be able to produce things such as bolts, um, and you're also going to be able to adjust the species composition. So you can steer a stand in one direction or another, depending upon what you cut and what you leave. 
the thinning is also a way that you can uh, determine which trees are going to be growing faster. So if you want your better quality trees to grow faster, you give them more sunlight. The trees that you cut to provide your better quality trees, and by better quality, I'm thinking like saw timber or the higher value, um, you're going to be uh, have an ample supply of boltwood. So if you have a few acres, you know, a dozen acres or 30 acres, and it's a hardwood forest, um, you probably have more boltwood than what you know what to do with. Uh, some people are going to approach us and say, you know, is it really okay to cut a tree? And if we're cutting a tree, um, how do you select which trees we should cut versus which trees we should keep? And the, the moral of that story is you focus on what you're leaving behind um, and then you accept whatever it is you're going to be cutting. But the, the first question, is it okay to cut trees? The best way I think to answer that is to look at a, what's called a stocking chart. And this is a depiction of, um, of how, of, a, of competition in a forest. So you can go out into the woods and you can measure the number of trees per acre. And you can measure what's called basal area per acre. And the basal area per acre is the, uh, think of that as the amount of wood. So you can have a whole lot of basal area on a few trees we can have a, a certain amount of basal area on a few trees that are large <coughs> or that <coughs> same amount of basal area uh, spread across lots of little trees. <coughs> In terms of whether it's okay to cut trees, uh, look at the, the red line on the right that intersects that what's called the A line or the line at the top is line of maximum competition. So this is a stand that is full. So that picture of the sugar maple that I showed you in the Eastern Adirondacks would have been on this line. And these diagonal lines are the lines of, of the average diameter. So this is average of five inches, di average five diameters, average, average diameter is five inches, sorry. And from that we drop down and we say, okay, there's about 740, well over here we can see 730 trees in the five inch uh, stand. To go an inch, for the average diameter to go up by an inch, think about what happens to the tree. The stem gets bigger by an inch, but that crown also has to expand because it's, uh, it's feeding uh, a larger root system and a larger stem. So there's expansion that's necessary. That expansion comes at a cost of other trees. And so to go from a five inch tree, there's 700 or a stand that has an average diameter of five inches to a stand that has an average diameter of six inches, you're going to lose by natural mortality, expect to lose 200 stems per acre. So these are trees that are just going to die. Uh, the question then is, is it okay for you to cut trees? I would say it is because those trees are going to die and particularly as somebody that's interested in a product, that product is a bolt that you're going to use to produce another product, which is a mushroom, then you're taking advantage, you're preemptively salvaging and taking advantage of the, of the value that's coming out of those woods. So the rule is when you look at the average across all of these uh, one inch changes in diameter, it averages about a 20% reduction in stems per acre for each inch increase. Uh, so essentially one in five trees must die in order to grow an inch. And another way to look at this is, and it's, I've heard it for oak stands, not for maple stands in eastern, northeastern hardwoods, but in oaks, about 80% of the stems are going to die between the age of 20 and the age of uh, 80 or 90. So 80% of the stems are going to die. So if you go out and cut a few trees, I'd say from the perspective of the forest, it is inconsequential. How do you do it? Uh, the, probably the easiest way to think about doing it is to do what's called a crop tree crown, um, crown thinning release or crop tree management. So a crop tree is a tree that you're going to grow into the future. And we think about every tree is having four quadrants or four faces of the crown. I have those numbered. And the way crop tree management works is you say which trees are competing with 
the crown of my crop tree. So it's not the trees that are below the canopy or below the crown of your crop tree. It's which trees are touching the crown. One crown is touching the crown of your crop tree. And then you can say, all right, we're going to cut those trees. So if we go backwards, you can count one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe seven trees got cut. Those are seven trees that are now in your boltwood pile, or let's say half of them are good for boltwood and the other half are not. And you get, uh, you know, three to five bolts per stem, depending upon the size. You just created 25 or 30 uh, bolts. And the, in the process, you released one crop tree. Uh, sometimes you get crop trees that are side by side, and it's okay to consider both of those crowns as one. It's also okay, to, you don't have to release four sides. You can release, and, and usually you don't want to release four sides unless it's a really young forest. You know, a forest where the average diameter is between four and eight inches, you can do a four-sided release. When you get above 12 or 14 inch diameter trees, you don't want to give them a four-sided release because of the shock factor. Um, so here we have the green are the crop trees, the yellow are the cut trees, and then the kind of the light green are the trees you would ignore. This is high intensity. Most people don't want to do this. You know, that's what it looks like. And I didn't even get all of the trees cut that I needed to get cut. Um, it's also okay to, to say, okay, we're going to focus on fewer trees and make sure we give them an adequate release. So the light blue in this case is the crop tree and the dark blue are the trees that are going to be cut. So that, uh, that covers the ecology and management uh, for bolts. Uh, and it's very, I mean, that's quick and simplified, but I think it gives you an idea of, of what you can do to go out into the woods and look for crop trees. And you decide what the crop is, and you decide what the qualities are in a crop tree that you want to, to concentrate growth in. Um, there was, in previous conversations that Steve and I have had, there's a sense that um, mushrooms tend to do better in the sap in the sapwood, we'll, we've, we'll describe some of the characteristics of sapwood. But um, following from this line of reasoning, then that would make sense to say, all right, well, how do we get bolt wood that has more sapwood? So think about, or what you need to understand about wood is that it's basically like a bundle of straws. And each of those straws is a cell, and those cells are called xylem. And the xylem is what carries the water up into the tree. Around the outside of the stem, just inside the bark, are a series of cells. It's a very thin layer called the phloem that carries the food down. There are parenchyma cells that are uh, living, and they store food. Um, as the older xylem is so as the tree can in every year the tree puts on a layer of wood on the outside of the stem the interior xylem is it, as it becomes older it becomes non-functional and it's a place that's that the tree uses to store waste products and as a result of that some trees have very dark the compounds that they're storing tend to be very dark such as this is a red oak and so you can see the heartwood is very prominent the sapwood is is lighter and on the outside. So the concern is that some of those some of those compounds that the tree is storing on the inside it's it's like where do they where do they send what they don't need anymore um, is are those compounds are toxic to mushrooms. Um, the heartwood also tends to have lower oxygen and higher um, uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, CO2, um, carbon dioxide than sapwood does. Um, heartwood does not store starch and it doesn't store sugar and it has very low nitrogen. So those are things that might be of benefit to mushrooms. So how do we get more sapwood? Well, one thing is that the, the trees that are growing faster are producing more wood and the trees that are producing more wood are gonna have more sapwood. So those are gonna be upper crown class trees that we talked about earlier because they have the most sunlight. 
the tendency is, and what we've been talking about up until this point is, well, you have these smaller trees and go ahead and cut them. You remember the one in five must die, and that's true, but you're going to find that a lot of those have a high percentage of heartwood. Um, and I don't know how, I don't know if there's uh, predictions on how that influences mushroom production, but to the extent that sapwood is important, those lower crown class trees are not going to be great. Those might be better for your firewood pile um, and less, um, less useful for your mushroom bolts. Um, and Steve may be able to comment more about that um, at the end when we, uh, to think about the, the importance of sapwood. So there are uh, triggers that force the loss of starches and add phenols because you have a low crown position, the trees get old, they get stressed or they get injured. And you can see this is some um, wood, I think from probably from the one on the right is some of my firewood or, or logs that have been um, are taken on the log landing. Uh, and, and you can see that this, the picture on the left, there's a wound and that tree was forming that heartwood. It appears to be right in result to that wound that ran the length of the stem. So good sapwood is going to be a result of kind of pampered trees to get, get plenty of everything. Here we see when you release uh, red oak trees, if you make them grow better, uh, regardless of the age, um, you give them more sunlight and they're going to grow faster, uh, as much as 62% faster. So the 16-year-old trees, uh, those are going to be relatively small in diameter. Those might be, um, uh, you know, four or five inches as a 16-year-old tree. And the 55-year-old tree could also be four or five or even eight inches. So it depends on the growing conditions. But these are trees that if you give them sunlight, they're gonna grow more wood, put more wood on the outside. And that wood's gonna be sapwood. So there, there may be some advantage when you're working in your woods to not cut all of the trees. <coughs> Maybe that you cut, cut trees specifically that benefit the crop trees. Some other trees in the middle are not crop trees. Don't cut them just because you can because they're gonna benefit from that added sunlight and in the future they may be better for boltwood production. So there's uh, things to focus on to emphasize sapwood. And um, one of these is that the sapwood has starches, so the tree produces sugars that stores them as starches as a result of photosynthesis, and those are stored in the sapwood. So the, the mushrooms are gonna be <clears throat> breaking down those carbohydrates, I'm assuming, as part of, a, as part of the decomposition. Um, there's probably slightly more sapwood at the base of the stem than at the base of the crown of the tree, so it's more as you get closer to the ground. And lower crown class species like red oak have uh, more heartwood. What's uncertain is about beech and sugar maple. What I've seen is that sugar maple tends to those lower crown class sugar maple trees, uh, when they get injured, they tend to compartmentalize and they get um, get the formation of, of darker heartwood. So you want to be focusing on upper crown class trees such as are pictured here. Now these are probably too big to serve as bolts. Um, the main stems, but you've got some of these branches that would probably be pretty good and, and fairly good in sapwood. So suggestions that I'll offer, and I, I'm qualifying this as suggestions because nobody's done research that says, how do you go out and, and manage your woods to have maximum sapwood production in low value trees, right? Um, first thing to do is have a, a plan for your woods and part of that is, and I say it at the top, is to keep track of what you find. So keep notes. Um, you can start with these suggestions and then refine them and let me know what you learn and let me know what you're observing. Uh, I recommend that you're gonna merchandise for optimum value. The bigger and the straighter trees of the right species are gonna be most valuable wool for timber. Second most important is probably gonna be mushroom bolts. Um, 
third is firewood, and then finally, economically, wildlife snags and deadfalls. And I'm not sure where maple, per, maple, oftentimes maple is above timber. So I, that, that's something to think about if you're working with sugar maple trees. One thing that's, that I do find in young forests, the trees that gain dominance early are the ones that have these forks. And so if you can see the picture on the left, you have this fork. Um, those are not necessarily good timber trees. They're very fast growing because they've dominated, they've, they've captured the canopy and they're doing well there. But then they're, um, uh, but they have this fork and that fork may split and that's the picture on the right is a red maple. This is the, the upper stem and then the lower, the lower kind of hump there is the other stem and then the sides are where the tree has been flexing the fork has been flexing and it grows wood on the outside to try to heal that wound so it might be that you can go into a relatively young woods cut out these trees that have that are big they may have fairly large diameters down here which would be fine for firewood but then these upper stems would be good to get them out of the woods to allow single stem trees to form and then you've got boltwood and firewood. And if you're young, as a person, if you're young, I'd encourage you to, to find some of these woods and work with them as a coppice because that's gonna be a great way to get the stems growing very fast and in, in full sunlight, cut them, let them sprout and then keep working. So here's a depiction of these crown classes. The D is the dominant. I've outlined that crown of the dominant tree. The C is the co-dominant. And there's the crown of that and the S is the suppressed. So you're going to end up, you know, probably the, the suppressed tree is always going to be a run. Uh, you can cut it, you can check it. When you check it, you can say, all right, this is, has good sap wood or not. And it'll either go into the boltwood pile or the firewood pile. So I've just got a couple of minutes left. I want to talk quickly about safety. And within the the confines of safety, we have what's called um, small scale woodlot management or low impact logging. And these are, there's not a great definition for this. I define it as essentially the harvesting of woodland products that prioritizes the lack of damage, usually with small equipment on small acreages and usually by the owner. And here's some different ways you can do it with ATVs or farm tractors or horses. Uh, the benefits of small-scale woodland management is that you're directly involved in what happens to your woods because that you care about your trees. If, you know, most of you, if you have a woodlot, you know every individual tree and they may even have a story with each one. You can develop a sustained yield on a very small scale and that's, that's easy. You know, the math is there, the biology is there, the theory is there. So you can continue to be productive um, long into the future on your own property. Um, and you can produce your own products working at your own pace. So the products might be bolts and other products. But there's some reality checks too before you go into this. Steve was talking about, do I buy bolts? Do I, do I um, sell bolts? Uh, first thing is, this is hard work. And for those of you that are still young, good, um, uh, I'm in my 50s now and I know there's, you know, I don't do things the way I used to 20 years ago. Um, and so it's really hard work. You can still do it, but you need to be in shape and it's a, you need to be more sensitive to things like tendonitis and pulled muscles and sprained backs and things like that as well. It's also um, a reality check that that time is money and you have to ante up. Right? So you're going to have to invest time. It takes the time that you're spending working in the woods is time that you're not spending doing something else, which may be fine. You just, this is part of your planning process is do you have the time to work in the woods? And part of that time is going to be spent in training. And then on top of that all, you need to make investments to purchase equipment such as chainsaws and safety gear and uh, vehicles to move uh, logs and bolts around. Small scale uh, woodlot management by its very definition is low productivity. So you're not going to be moving a lot of wood at a time. And that might be just fine, but 
for me, this was a challenge because I'm, you know, on, on my day job, I'm out and I'm watching commercial loggers moving multiple truckloads of wood a day. And then uh, at the end of the day or, you know, on the weekends, I'm out in the woods and I'm moving a couple dozen, <laughs> a couple dozen trees. So it's just, you got to know what to expect. Um, you're going to have to be creative in how you solve problems. This is a great picture. This is a friend of mine, Mike Grayson, and this was firewood, but you could imagine a similar configuration as long as you're safe. You know, how do you get firewood bolts or how do you get mushroom bolts out of the woods? So you have to know what your resources are, and maybe you have a neighbor that's a resource because they can weld a rack onto your uh, little John Deere tractor. Uh, working in the woods is dangerous and be very conscious that what you're doing can kill yourself or kill somebody else. So training is essential. Make sure you, the best training program is called Game of Logging. With Game of Logging, you learn directional felling. Uh, you decide where the tree is going to go. It emphasizes safety and productivity. Um, know that you have friends and family members and neighbors, and they all have strengths and weaknesses. Um, just because you have somebody that's part of your team that wants to work in the woods doesn't mean that they should work in the woods. Or if they do work in the woods, you need to be extra careful with um, who's around them and what they're allowed to do. So just um, be careful that you don't, uh, be careful what you ask for, you might just get it. So there's a few safety rules that I focus on. The very most important one is to be where you are. Focus on the task at hand. When you're cutting down trees, even small trees, think about where you are. Don't be thinking about getting your, uh, your oil changed in your car or taking your kid to soccer practice or whatever. You have to focus on that tree because in the the things that happen can happen instantaneously, and you have to be you have to anticipate and avoid problems. Find and use the correct equipment. Uh, this the ATV in the upper left hand corner is capable of doing some things at a, at one price point, and the John Deere tractor in the lower right is at a higher price point but does a lot more. Take advantage of training, such as game of logging, and then know your limitations. So this was a tree uh, I'd taken game of logging one. We hadn't really worked on wedges. I knew they were possible, and I thought that I could do more. I thought my wedges could do more than what they could do. So this is, this is a, a humility picture for me, but it's a teachable moment. Um, know what you can do and know what you can't do. And so with that, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm happy to answer any questions that people may have. Thanks, Peter. That was great. Um, I'll uh, invite the folks in the class to put any questions in the chat box. If you don't see your chat box, you may need to find it. And there's a black toolbar usually at the top or bottom of your screen. And um, and sometimes you have to hover your mouse over it to, for it to pop up, depending on your system. So, um, But okay. if you want to type any questions in there, we'll take a couple minutes, and then we'll transition to the next piece about sourcing uh, logs. But I want to just thank Peter again for his time and really informative presentation. You've really <laughs> continued to summarize this, this, um, this challenge of uh, matching matching our wood lot management to mushroom cultivation. I think mushroom cultivation, as you suggested, really um, provides an opportunity to do some of that thinning that uh, may not otherwise feel doable. So, so, that's, so that's, the, the last time, Steve, that you and I had talked about this, there was, there, that we were, the thinking was, as I understood it, that sapwood was really important. Is that still a priority with, with, I mean, is that a, a, a major determinant of production from a bolt yeah. of wood? So I, I think it, it still stands that we haven't done any research to compare, you know, high sapwood ratio trees to low sapwood and see what the actual production is. I think we're, as you said, making a deduction from the sort of biology perspective and what we know. Um, we, we have some anecdotal evidence and I guess what, you know, all the research that we did at Cornell with Ken 
at the Arnott Forest, which you're f very familiar with, um, you know, was on uh, a wide range of trees, but a lot of suppressed trees. We didn't really think about this piece. And so the production data that we have, which is, which shows good profitability potential, you know, is on a, a wide range. We didn't think about this piece, right? So I think right. any small diameter tree you cut out of your woods, you're going to get decent production. Um, but I think that uh, if we want to maximize our production and we have the opportunity to get wood that we know has higher sap wood value, there's, there's, there's a good chance it's going to give us a little more. We just don't know how much. Um, so it's, I think it's an, it's a, an awareness and an observation exercise, right? Because uh, capturing that value from a timber harvest or maybe your neighbor's timber harvest and recognizing those, those bolts might be valuable for mushrooms. You know, those things are often left left in the woods uh, and um, and or you know there's some other opportunities which I'll talk about from my experience but you know it's sort of I don't I don't want to say that people need to um, spend all their time shopping for the, the wood out there that has the highest sap wood right, we can right. Get really per perfect is the enemy of good yeah yeah, yeah. So, um, so there are so there are a couple of questions here let me just you've Steve has answered many of them so thank you um, it's okay he's confused about what crown class is uh refers to certain species shade tolerance so it it's it can be influenced by shade tolerance what is the the strict definition of crown class is the height of one tree relative to its neighbors so if a tree next to its neighbors is getting um or if it for you know even forgetting about the neighbors maybe if if the crown of a tree is directly impacted by sunlight it's in the upper canopy if it's not directly impacted so if it's either indirect light or no direct light then it would be a lower crown class tree and it and it's when you when you go out into the woods and you look up into the canopy you will see those and then you will see other attributes of them so the shape of the crown of the upper clown upper crown class trees their crown is much bigger because they're getting more sunlight relative to the smaller ones the the shade tolerance plays in and i kind of blended blurred those two slides together i apologize shade tolerance is such that you have a, a species that's intolerant of shade you will not find in lower crown class position so aspen or if it is in a lower crown class position it's in the process of dying so aspen is a lower is very intolerant of shade. If it's in the lower crown class, it's going to die. So that's that's that. Um, I see a question about uh, any good resources you recommend for tree identification. Um, so I have a couple of webinars on uh, what is like ten common hardwoods and ten common conifers, and. I'm, I have a tree identification short course that I need to revise. I have a framework set up for it in Teachable and I haven't had a chance yet to do that revision. So I'd initially built it in Moodle and then it had problems. So, so there are some online resources. There are some books, if you're in New York, there's a book by Don Leopold that's called Trees of New York, Native and Naturalized. And that's a fabulous book. It's not a field guide. You don't take it in the woods, but it has phenomenal pictures and line drawings and descriptions. So I'll, I'll add my two favorite books to the Sibley Guide to Trees, uh, which is a great one for a lot of different species. It's not, it's not geography, as geography specific. And then there's a great key, key book. I don't know, Peter, if you've ever looked at the book called Bark. Huh, um, I've heard of it. I've heard, I have not, I need to get a copy of that. I have not done that. Yeah, it was a, I think a New Hampshire forestry students like PhD project was a, it's a key oh. guide for identifying trees based on their bark, which is great because obviously Neat. that's much often what we have to work with. That's so, right. Yeah. That's right. So Jeff says, are you aware of anyone making a living on a stand of timber? Um, not, uh, well, so kind of yes. And it, when how many acres? Thousands of acres. Uh, if it's just for timber, um, judging hardwood before it's cut down. Uh, if if you see you know kind of injuries on the stem and it's lower crown class, I think you can guess that it probably has a fair amount of of hardwood in it. Um, 
Did you answer is there a minimum a um, acreage of a wood lot, which makes oh, sense? Oh, yes. For yeah. economic value. So it depends on it depends on what you mean by economic value. If that's for timber management, you're probably not going to get a logger to show up into a wood lot that's less than uh, 15 acres. If you had really high value trees, you might get them in for five or 10 acres. But I mean, loggers have just a kind of a transaction, a, 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 not a yeah, transaction. When they move from one property to the next, it costs them, let's say, $1,000 to load their equipment on a truck and drive it there. So there has to be enough value for them to start breaking even. And then there's also opportunity cost. And if they come to a property that's 10 acres and uh, they, can, they have to compare that to being able to say what would they make if they went to a property that was 50 acres or 100 acres. So it, it depends. But the more you're willing to do yourself, and if you think more broadly about economic value in terms of mushrooms and maple and things like that, now you're into pretty decent economic returns on uh, small acreages of, you know, five or 10 or 20 acres. So... Uh, Jeff says, we used to clear cut, now we select cut. I'm unaware of anybody that nurtures the forest, crops the seedlings after cut. Is there a potential for a business model here? Um, there's, so clear, clear cutting is a valid technique. The selection system is a valid technique. Um, going in and, and you have to be careful. Sometimes the use of the word select cut might mean um, kind of a, kind of a tending cut or a selection system, or it might mean cutting the biggest and the best and leaving the rest. So you select the, the valuable trees and leave the less valuable trees. So there are not people that I know of that, that deliberately nurture the forest if you think about like you would nurture your garden. And that's only because the return interval, the return on investment is so long. You know, the cost for you to nurture a forest and then you carry that investment for 80 years just doesn't make sense economically. So there are things that we do kind of in the woods that make that play out a little bit better. And things like mushrooms, like Steve was just saying, if you're nurturing the woods when it's the average tree is three to four or five inches in diameter and you're getting a little bit of money back on those bolts, then that's going to be, uh, uh, that's going to be an economically feasible option. So, all right. I don't, Steve, I don't want to cut into your talk time any more than I have.